Bobcock, and welcome to Between the Covers. You're in for a treat. Lisa Unger is my guest today. You know her as the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of 17 novels. She sold millions of copies of her books worldwide. She's published in 26 languages. Her books have been on, I don't know, umpteen best book lists. And she's won or been nominated for numerous awards. Please welcome Lisa Unger and her latest book, Confessions on the 745. Hi, Anne. I'm so excited to be here. I am so happy you're here. And I don't know if I should say this or not say this, but let me tell you, Confessions on the 745 is my new favorite Lisa Unger book. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Oh, you are so welcome. Before we get into the book, would you do us the honor of reading from the prologue? I would love to. Yeah, absolutely. From the prologue of Confessions on the 745. She watched. That was her gift to disappear into the black, sink into the shadows behind and between. That's where you really saw things for what they were, when people revealed their true natures. Everyone was on broadcast these days, thrusting out versions of themselves, cropped and filtered for public consumption. Everyone putting on the show of me. It was when people were alone, unobserved, that the mask came off. She'd been watching him for a while. The mask he wore was slipping. He, too, stood in the shadows of the street, a hulking darkness. She followed him as he, as he drove, circling like a predator, then finding a place for his car under the trees. He parked, then sat as the night wound on and inside lights went out one by one. Finally, he stepped out of his vehicle, closed the door quietly, and slipped across the street. Now he waited. What was he doing? Since she'd been following him the last few weeks, she'd seen him push his children on the swings in the park, visit a strip club in the middle of the day, drink himself stupid with his buddies viewing a game at a sports bar. She'd watched him as he helped a young mother with a toddler and baby in a carriage carry her groceries from her car to her house. Once, he would picked up a woman in a local bar. Then, out in the parking lot, they romped like animals in his car. Later, he went to the grocery store and picked up food for his family, his cart piled high with ice cream and goldfish crackers, things his kids liked. What was he up to now? The observer only sees, never interferes. Still, tonight, she felt the tingle of bad possibilities. She waited in the cool night, patient and still. The clicking of heels echoed, a brisk staccato up the deserted street. She felt a little pulse of dread. Was there no one else around? No one else glancing out their windows? No, she was the only one. Sometimes, didn't it seem like people didn't see anymore? They don't look out, they look down at that device in their hands or in, or in mesmerized by the movie of past and future, desires and fears, always playing on the screen in their minds. The figure of the young woman was slim, Erect, confident, she marched up the street, sure-footed, hands in her pockets, tote over her shoulder. When he moved out of the shadows and blocked her path, the young woman stopped short, backed up a step or two. He reached for her, as if to take her hand, but she wrapped her arms around her middle. There were words she couldn't hear, in exchange, sharp at first, then softer, on the air, far away. They sounded like calling birds. What was he doing? Fear was a cold finger up her spine. He moved to embrace the girl and she shrank away, but he moved in anyway. In the night, he was just a looming specter. His bulk swallowed her tiny form and together in a kind of dance, they moved toward the door, first jerking, awkward. Then she seemed to give in, soften into him. She let them both inside and then the street was silent again. She stood frozen, unsure of what she'd seen. Later, when she realized what he'd done, who he truly was under the mask, she'd hate herself for staying rooted hiding in the shadows, only watching. She'd tell herself that she didn't know then. She didn't know that beneath the mask, he was a monster.
Thank you, Lisa. Earlier today, somebody had gone on Facebook and said, oh, Lisa's coming on. I hope I finish this book before it starts. Well, you don't have to finish the book now because we are not going to get into how it ends up when we're going to talk around the plot, not through it. But if anybody else has Facebook questions, go ahead and send them to us and hopefully we can get to them. I'm going to talk a little bit around this book. Selena Murphy misses her train. I think it's the 540 she normally takes from the city. She needs to get home. She needs to have her routine be what it always is. Dinner, the, the kids, the uh, bedtime. Well, now this routine is shot because she has to take the next train, which is 745. And that's where it starts. Can you... Tell us as much as you are comfortable to say about what happens on this train. Right. So, yeah, when we meet Selena, you know, um, she's having a, a terrible day. She's having a very, very bad day, probably the worst day of her life. And, you know, she does. She misses that train and she's, you know, just, you know, in a pretty dark space when she finally does catch the 745. And she winds up um, sitting next to a beautiful stranger. And just out of nowhere, the stranger strikes up a conversation with a confession. And you know what? Maybe it's a terrible day that she had or the drink that she shouldn't have had or you know, just the dark of this stalled train. Um, but this confession um, leads Selena to share a secret of her own, something that she has never told anyone um, and couldn't tell anyone in her life. And then the train sort of comes back to life and she's headed back into her world and you know, is really embarrassed. You know, she thinks, oh my God, you know, why did I share this secret part of myself with somebody I've, I've never met? And um, she hopes that, you know, she's never going to see this beautiful stranger on the train ever again. But of course, she will. So that's basically how it all begins for Selena. All right. I have to get inside your head for a minute. Why is it that people are so willing to share secrets with a stranger? Right. You, you know, it's a good question because I, as an extreme introvert, would never dream of sharing anything about myself. In fact, I um, would actively avoid having any kind of conversation <laughs> with a stranger on a train. And I've actually heard from a lot of introverts, you know, that like, wow, I would never do this, you know. But, you know, I think that, you know, there's something really interesting to me about the about this like liminal space that Selena finds herself in. It's like, you know, the space between places, you know, she's not the person she was when she left where she was, and she's not the person that she's going to be when she gets where she's going. And it's like, often we find these spaces, like sort of when, you know, we're traveling and, you know, you, you wind up right next to somebody, you know, close proximity. I mean, in, in other days when we could still travel and sit next to somebody. Um, but we, you know, we find ourselves like everything in that person's life and everything in your life, like led you to that exact moment. There's definitely an energy there, you know, where you wind up often in conversation with somebody that you've never met. But, you know, also I think Selena is like in this kind of place where, you know, she's really she's like very she's like one of these super women that our culture is so good at pr producing you know she's the mom with the big career in the house and you know she's um very you know invested in this idea of herself you know she even thinks of it in the book as instagrammable selena you know this sort of facade that she's promoted out about herself and so she's got this, you know, I think in, in being very invested in that, she's kind of neglected some of the rot in her life and things are festering and going very bad, very quickly. And she doesn't feel like she can share any of that, not with her sister, not with her best friend, not with her mother. And yet she finds herself, you know, in this dark train, this stalled train with this woman who's sharing like something very dark and personal about herself and like, I think in that moment, she just felt like, you know, I can also share my darkness here with this person who I'm never going to see again. Um, but that's not the way it's going to work for Selena. 
Yeah. I we do have a question that just came in and it it's very interesting because it is about the characters and and they're saying your characters are often deeply conflicted and I would say that's an understatement for many of them. <laughs> do you create them for a better story are or are they perhaps modeled after people that you know? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I, a long time ago, I think, and you and I have talked about this. I, I like a long time ago, stopped thinking about characters as people that I create and started thinking of them more as people that I meet, because I really do feel that they come to me almost fully formed and I get to know them in layers the same way that, you know, my reader does. And like in the same way, that we get to know anyone that enters our lives. You know, you meet somebody and you only know the surface of that person. And then as you get, you know, more and more intimate with that person in friendship or relationship, then slowly the layers of that person get revealed. And, you know, usually there's, you know, there's a lot more to a person than you, when you meet them, you know, just at that, in that first encounter. And so that's kind of the way I feel about my characters and as they evolve, you know, I think, I mean, I think a lot of people are deeply conflicted. You know, there, you don't meet too many people who are, you know, 100% sure of themselves all the time. Um, and so it's just sort of the way characters evolve for me on the page. It's not so much a choice that I'm making about how I want this character to be, or do I need more attention? There aren't a lot of choices that I make that like that. You know, it's just very much, you know, um, the voices that I hear, how the characters revealing themselves, and then how the plot flows from those characters. Lisa, I have to look at the social media commentary thread that goes on in this book, because Selena has this Facebook perfectly Instagrammable life, and she's posting this perfect life while her real life is really falling apart. And there was something that I marked because I thought it was so fascinating. And it said, was it a lie to only show the glittering moments? What about the dull, the mundane, the ugly? If they weren't posted online, were they less real? So while we're thinking about that, this is the perfect time to see if anybody has a Facebook question, go ahead and send it in. And in the book, because of this, does it make it easier for your villains, your con artists to pull their jobs? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think we're all sort of, you know, the social media is something that, you know, came on the scene, I guess. I'm trying to think of what, 10 years ago now, maybe like prior to that, you know, none of us had ever really engaged in the level that we do in social media. And I think that there's a tendency, you know, to put out, you know, sort of a version of ourselves, a curated version, a curated and filtered version of our lives and put it out there for people to see. But most of us know that real life is the moments that are lived between those like curated and filtered social media posts. And that in putting out only these sort of glittering moments, these person, you know, these very like, you know, prettyfied moments, you know, and then the real person is basically, you know, you're sitting there and you're watching the social media feed, this very two dimensional sort of portrayal of other people and you're comparing it to your very messy three dimensional existence. And I think that in a way, it's kind of like, it's something that, that, you know, that all people do, but women do as well. And I think it might be a little bit, it's something that we definitely want to look at because, you know, it's not the, it's not the, it's not perfection that makes us relatable to each other. It's not, you know, it's not what you created and what you put out there that makes you relatable to others, who you truly are. And so that was something that, uh, that was a theme that I, I explored quite a bit in this book. You know, I remember a few books back what scared me was when you your, your book was about the dark web. And I thought, first of all, I wondered, yes. how do you know so much about the dark web? But this one, we're just giving everything away. So it, it kind of begs the yeah. question, can anybody be conned? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so that's a, that's another big theme of the book is like sort of the con artist and, and the con itself. And 
um, you know, I, I kind of, it was one of the seeds for the book. Um, I was doing my research on con artists and I came across a book uh, by Maria Konnikova called The Confidence Game. And in it, she did a, you know, a really in-depth study of like, you know, very famous con artists as well as, um, you know, the history of the con and, um, you know, all the reasons why people you know, very, very intelligent people fall for scams all the time. And, you know, social media is one of the ways in which, you know, we are telegraphing ourselves to potential con artists, because we're basically giving away so much information about ourselves all the time without even realizing it. You might not even realize that you're, you know, you're giving out information about where you work, where you spend your time, where your child goes to school, you know, oh, here I am at this bake sale or, you know, Martine night with my friends or whatever it is, and you're giving out all kinds of information, you're also showing the potential con artist who you are and what it is that you want. And that is the gift of the con artist is to determine what you want and give it to you so that you will give him or her what she wants and so it's it's a very it's a very subtle way like you know you think you're just you think it's private in a way and you don't think anybody is watching except your friends who you trust but in fact people are watching well i think your readers will be very interested in who is conning who in confessions of the 745 one thing that you have perfected lisa is this gray area this this area between, you know, defining the, the good guys and the bad guys, it's not just, it's not black and white. And I, this has to go back to your study of the human psyche because nobody is either all good or all bad. I do believe that, you know, I think that some people make really bad choices a lot of the time and some people make good choices most of the time, but most of us are making some combination of good and bad choices all the time. I don't think that you, you know, you see to in, in life, like I don't think you see too many true villains, which is not to say there aren't very bad people and there certainly there are. Um, and you know, the argument could be made for, you know, true evil or not. But, you know, most of the time when you look at criminals or you look at people who um, are doing wrong in their lives, you're often looking at people who are victims themselves. They're victims of abuse, of childhood trauma, of, you know, whatever circumstances created who they are. And so I think that it's not, uh, I, it's not, it's not wrong to explore those people and the reasons for why they may be who they are and if it makes them more sympathetic and more um to to a reader but in life also more sympathetic and more you know people open their hearts to to help others instead of judge and, and criminalize then i think that that's a that's a powerful thing that um that exploring character in fiction and in life can accomplish you have pulled off something really interesting in this book, and that is you have multiple voices, but they're all very well-defined characters. Now, we, we talked about Selena a little bit. She may be, in my mind, the most relatable character, but I'd like to look at a few others if we could. Pearl, for instance, and you call her invisible which makes her a really interesting character. Do you want to talk about what you can talk about with Pearl? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they were, so usually, you know, how things work for me is like, you know, I have an obsession, which, you know, um, in this case was, you know, the idea of the, of the con, you know, of this idea that you, you can't con an honest man. And it led me to a lot of research. And so I became kind of obsessed with that idea. And then the, what happens from that point is I start hearing a voice or voices. Um, and those are the voices that I follow through the manuscript. And in the case of this book, it was Selena, of course, but also Pearl. Pearl was another, uh, was a character that, you know, sort of presented um, as a younger version of herself. And um, the first thing you kind of know about her is that she considers herself to be a watcher that she's somebody who kind of sinks into the shadows and really observes other people. 
because she feels that when people are unobserved that that or they feel they're unobserved that that's when they reveal the trueness of themselves where she can see their real face and this is something that she's very you know very interested in you know she's raised by and this is something that's very common of a of an abused child or a child who's raised in an unpredictable home environment that they become watchers you know they watch the expressions on their parents face because they need to predict whether they're going to be yelled at or hit or whether they're going to get fed or whatever and it turns them into these you know very keen observers of people and you know it's a it's a survival mechanism and that was like sort of the one thing that i knew about about Pearl when I first started hearing her voice. And she, of course, you know, is formed in a very, in a very dark, in the very dark crucible of her childhood. And um, it forms her later behavior into adulthood. Was she the most fun character to develop and write about? And that may be a very unfair question because they're all so <laughs> good. But, but to, to me, she, she was so fascinating. Um, she really was, for me, the heart and soul of the book. You know, her story is really, it was really the, um, the core of Confessions on the 745. Selena is, is certainly a huge part of it, and their lives are very entwined. And, you know, I think Selena is probably, you know, the most familiar character, the, the person that we know and the person that we might even be at some point in our lives, you know, like she's very much, she's present and, you know, is very compelled by her journey, you know, where she starts the book and where she ends up. Um, but Pearl was really the heart and soul of the story and her journey um, was, you know, extremely sort of colorful and layered. And, you know, definitely I enjoy diving into those sort of, sort of the, the, the crevices of, of Pearl's psyche. I am fascinated by the how, like how the writer works. Some writers have the entire storyline before they start, some plots grow while they're writing. And I ran across this quote by E.L. Doctorow that I thought was very interesting. It's, writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights but you can make the whole trip that way. So tell me, which kind of writer are you? That's that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly how I write. Like I do not have an outline. I don't know what's going to happen day to day. I don't know who's going to show up or what they're going to do. I definitely don't know how the book is going to end. If I knew, I wouldn't be able to write it because I write for the same reason that I read. You know, I want to know what's going to happen to these characters who are living in my head. And I have written, I just sat down to write my my 20th novel and I have written every every single novel this way. And, and that quote really, oh, whenever I hear it, it truly resonates with me because I, it's the perfect description of how I make my way through every single novel. I'm not sure how you did it with this one because the crafting is so extraordinary. It is complicated. It is twisty. As I said, there are multiple characters, but there are also multiple timelines and, and lots of voices. Even in your head, how, how do you put it together? How did you, did, okay, how, did you know how this was going to play out? No. <laughs> I had no idea. I mean, I really do. I really do follow those voices through through the manuscript. And I it's almost like the plot is there and I just have to find it. I mean, that's sort of how it has always worked for me. So I just, um, you know, I, and I know it's kind of it's kind of a difficult thing to understand. But I, I guess in a way, I feel like my, you know, my whole education and then like my life as a reader, like everything has been pretty focused on writing and, you know, and the novel, you know, that's been the the core of my, of my education. And so I think in many ways, you know, I've sort of internalized that form and it's just kind of the way my mind works. And, you know, I, I just, I feel like I, I just dig through the, you know, I hear these voices and I dig through the layers of these characters and I find I find the story and where it connects. And it's almost like my subconscious knows the story, but my intellectual mind 
doesn't actually know it until we're at a certain point and then it maybe will become clear to me where where we're going but like you know it even to the degree that like I'll write something and just go hmm, I'm not sure why I'm writing this or why it's here and then 50 pages later I'll be like oh right that's why I wrote that because now I need it for this and so it's very much the way the entire novel pieces itself together even with multiple timelines and multiple perspectives. Lisa, I guess we can kind of wrap it up by saying, be careful who you choose to tell your secrets to, especially if it's a stranger sitting next to you on the commuter train. Lisa <laughs> Unger has done it again. Confessions on the 745 is full of surprises and suspense. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. It is always great to see you and talk with you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for having me. It's always such a joy to hang out with you and, and talk with you. Thank you so much. I'm Anne Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers.